First of all, again, my name is William Branham. I am the founder of a little company called Naked Warrior Recovery. Um, it's a CBD company because CBD was a, a, a modality that helped me turn down the noise in my head. Uh, after 26 years of service, after some maybe not so awesome relationships, I got a bunch of baggage that I carry around. And CBD helped turn the noise down so I could have more positive self-talk. I could, I could fix myself. Because, you know, it's funny. We were talking today and uh, the comment was like, oh, so you're, you're human. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I am actually. I'm just a regular guy that did some cool stuff once upon a time. Um, but CBD was something that helped turn down the noise in my head so that I could have more positive self talk. And, and so I started my company, Naked Warrior Recovery, to help other veterans, first responders, teachers, nurses, doctors, whoever, who are struggling, suffering, to help turn down the noise in their head, to help take off that baggage that they're carrying around and help them to get naked. So I also came up with the, what I like to call the get naked mindset. That's about taking that armor that you carry around off, that baggage that you carry around off. Set it in the corner so you can be a little bit more vulnerable, you can find the healing that you need. I also make NAKED an acronym, and so the acronym for NAKED it stands for, the N is for never quit. You're gonna feel like quitting today, but you're not gonna do it. The A is accept failure, you're probably gonna meet some failure today. That's okay, just keep pushing through it. The K is to kill mediocrity. The fact that you showed up today, you're already killing mediocrity in your life. The E is expose your fears. This is a scary workout. Again, you're showing up, you're exposing those fears and you're working through it. And D is do the work because this is work. So, it was a fall morning about 0830. We finished morning PT. We're loading the trucks, ready to go to the range. I was an instructor at sniper school. We got in the, the students had already left. The, uh, I got in the truck with one of the other instructors. We turned on the, the, uh, the radio, and the guy on the radio was talking about the World Trade Center bombing back in the early 90s, where some terrorists put some demolitions in the back of a truck, parked it underneath the World Trade Center, and set it off. It didn't do that much damage, just some minor structural damage to the World Trade Center. You know, kind of the thought about that is that's not rational thinking. And then the guy, and we're kind of talking about that. We're like, that was weird that someone tried to do that. And then the guy talked about someone flew an airplane into the World Trade Center. And we're thinking, what dummy was flying, trying to fly his plane in between the towers? Maybe it was like some sort of, he had a fight with his girlfriend, he was suicidal, and he smashed his little crop duster airplane into the World Trade Center. Then the guy said it was a commercial airliner that crashed into the World Trade Center. So now Jeff and I, we're like, what? What the hell's going on? So we turned around, we didn't make it to the range, we turned around, we went back to the compound, we went inside, turned on the TV, and we saw the first tower on fire. I was like, that's not good. So I called the class back to so they could see what was going on on the television. Maybe they had family members that worked in the World Trade Center, maybe they had family members that were was on that, that aircraft, that commercial aircraft that crashed into the, into the towers. Still, it didn't make sense. As the students are walking in the door, we watch the second airplane smash into the second tower of the World Trade Center. Now we know something is very wrong. And we're trying to process rationally what's going on. Then we hear that an airplane was crashed into the Pentagon and a fourth airplane crashed in a field outside of the DC area. It didn't take us long to figure out that this was an attack on America. This was an attack on freedom. This was an attack on the world. America being the world power. It was an attack on the world. Attacking the symbols of America. The symbols of the world. The symbols of freedom. So, even though I was the senior instructor at sniper school, I was not the senior man. I had student instructors that were more senior to me. I had students in the class that were more senior to me. And they all turned to me and said, what do we do? And I said, I don't know. This isn't reasonable. This isn't rational thinking. How, what rational thought would make 20 individuals take over four aircraft and smash them into 
buildings, killing thousands. We sat there and we watched the towers burn and collapse. We were absolutely help helpless. We couldn't do anything about it. We're highly trained individuals in warfare. We can't do anything about that. So I called back to the headquarters and I said, hey, what do we do? And they said, I said, do we go to New York and help with the recovery operation? Or do we return to base? They said, no, continue training because we're gonna need your skill set very soon. Watch that. The next day we went back to the range. We continue training. My class graduated soon after that. We started deploying to Afghanistan and later to Iraq. Fast forward to 2005. I'm in SEAL Team 10. We deployed to Iraq. We're told you need to keep the interim government of Iraq alive. This is strategic mission for the United States of America. This is a no fail mission. You cannot let anything happen to those guys. Watch that. I'd rather hunt bad guys, but I'll do what I'm told. June 28th of 2005, we finished our detail. I'm back at my room, resting, getting ready for chow. My VIP is secure in his compound. And one of my new guys comes in, knocks on the door. And he says, hey, there's a helicopter down in Afghanistan and it's got our guys on it. I don't know what that means. So I go to the jock, I walk in the door and I see these two big televisions. And there's an MH-47 on the ground on top of a mountain engulfed in flames. I have three questions. Who was, on the air, who was on the aircraft? Are there survivors? And what the hell were they doing there in the daytime? Did we work at night? Because it's safer for us. We just later learned who was on the aircraft, why they were there in the daytime, what to do next. So we soon found out who was on the aircraft and who died and why they were there. But we didn't really learn why they were there, why they were there in the daytime, what really happened. So on that day, we lost 11 SEALs and eight Army Nighthawk, Night Stalker aviation professionals. Their names are Michael Murphy, Danny Dietz, Matthew Axelson, Eric Patton, Dan Healy, James Sue, Jacques Fontaine, Eric Christensen, Jeffrey Lucas, Mike McGreevy, Jeff Taylor, those are the SEALs. The Army Night Stalkers were, I'm gonna mess up their names because I didn't know them personally. Shamus Gore, Corey Goodnight, Kip Jacoby, Marcus Morales, Stephen Reich, Michael Russell, Chris Schirkenbach, and James Ponder. Those are the Army guys we lost that day. So we never really found out what happened until we got back from that deployment. The commander of Special Operations Command came down and briefed us on really what happened. And I'll probably mess up some details but I'll give you the overview. You've probably already heard it a few times. I've got a little bit of a different perspective on it. So, SEAL Team 10 Echo Platoon deployed to Bagram, Iraq. They were going after a bad guy. He was a warlord in the area. They wanted to have as much intel as possible before they did an assault and took down that warlord. So they put four guys on the ground about 2,500 kilometers away on top of a mountain. You can't see that much from that far away but it was far away that they were out of danger. The bad guys in the compound would never know they were there and they could get sort of a pattern of life. They could see women, children, fighters, vehicles, weapons, things like that. But the intel they could pass back to the headquarters in preparation for the assault on that compound. So the SR team, Special Reconnaissance Team, they came in via MH-47 big two turbine helicopter. The mountain was so steep that they had to fast rope in. The helicopter couldn't land to let them run off. It was so steep, they had to fast rope in. And when they hit the ground, they rolled about halfway down the mountain because they're carrying about 150 pounds worth of equipment. 
radios, water, food, hide material, a lot of stuff. Weapons, ammo. And so once they finally stopped rolling down the hill, they put their back their rucksacks on and they marched back up the hill, found where they were supposed to set up a hide site. It's never, it's never on the ground, never the way you think it's gonna be. They eventually got to a hide site. They made a big ruckus getting there. You know, big helicopters spinning around, but they thought they were far enough away from that compound. There were no bad guys. No bad guys would find them. Well, the Afghanis, they know the mountains. They know everything about that area. And we got four dudes carrying about 300 pounds worth of equipment, breaking brush through an area that they've never been in before. At night, they're gonna leave some, some signs. So the Afghanis knew that something was up because they could hear the helicopters in the area. So they sent a young shepherd boy. And yes, they do have shepherds that move sheep and goats around around the area. Young shepherd boy, they said, go see what you can find because we, they, we know that they will not kill you. Shepherd boy went looking. He saw some signs, look at that. There's probably someone may have been here. They may still be here. He walked right into the middle of the hide site that they had set up. It scared him just as much as it scared them. They wrapped the guy up, but they made some mistakes. When they landed, they should have made, they made comms back to the headquarters, but they couldn't make comms because they were using satellite communication and there was a big mountain in the way of the satellite. You can only talk if you can see the satellite. So they never made comms. Once they got to their hide site, the mountain was still in the way. They never made comms. Eventually they decided to let the kid go. He went back, he did his job, and he let the people who sent him know that there were Americans. And the SR team stayed. They didn't leave, they should have left. They should have waited till night, let the kid go, and then aborted the mission. But they didn't, they stayed. Rational thinking, they were thinking rationally. What could possibly go wrong? We're well trained, we can do a lot of stuff. We can handle pretty much anything that's thrown at us. But the enemy came at them from an angle they did not expect, from a high angle. Caught them off guard, shot them off of a mountain. These guys still don't have comms with the headquarters. Lieutenant Michael Murphy, after being wounded, after several guys were wounded, and they were pushed pretty much off the mountain into a ravine with big rocks, now they were kind of protected but they were still, they had at least three guys wounded and they didn't know where Marcus Luttrell was. So, Michael Murphy said, we need help. My job is to get you out of here, to save your lives. And so he climbed up on the highest peak, the highest point that he could, exposed himself to direct enemy fire, held his satellite phone high in the air, as best he could and called, kept hitting call until the call went through, until it made comms to the headquarters in Bagram. And he said, we are troops in contact, troops in contact, multiple wounded. And he got shot while he was up there again. He continued to fight until he was wounded mortally. The guys back in Bagram got the message. They went and woke up the helicopter pilots. Hey, we have guys in trouble right now. We need to get there now. Not a single member of the army or from the SEAL teams said, I don't think we should go in the daytime. The night stalkers only fly at night. If you've ever seen the movie Black Hawk, or uh, yeah, Black Hawk Down, that was Task Force 160. They are the best in the world. They only fly at night. They said, let's go. So four helicopters, two full of SEALs, two gunships went to that mountain. They started to land. The first helicopter started to land and the Taliban shot them down. And that's where we lost those 16 guys. The other helicopter, I talked to guys that were on the other helicopter. We almost had two helicopters down. They said RPGs were flying right past us. I don't know how we didn't get hit. This workout is named after Michael Murphy who went above and beyond to try and save the lives of his men on the ground. 
after being mortally wounded. But the workout is not about Michael Murphy. This workout is about the men that died on that mountain. This workout is about the men and women who died on 9-11. This workout is about the men and women who have died protecting freedom from the beginning of our country to today. This workout is about the first responders who died in the towers, the first responders who serve us every single day, the teachers, the doctors, the nurses, the people who serve us, who give us freedom, who give us education the people who serve us every single day. These are the people who step into the arena. Teddy Roosevelt wrote a, a speech one time that we like to call the man in the arena. And it goes something like this. The poorest way to face a life is to face it with a sneer. There are many men who feel a kind of twisted pride and cynicism. There are many who confine themselves to the criticism of the way others do what they themselves dare not even attempt. There is no more unhealthy being, no man less worthy of respect than he who either really holds or feigns to hold an attitude of sneering disbelief to all that is great and lofty, whether in achievement or in that noble effort where even if he fails comes the second achievement. It isn't the critic who counts. It isn't the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man or woman who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives gallantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best, in the end, knows the triumph of high achievement. And at worst, even if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his fate shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Today, when you do the first, you are stepping into the arena. You're gonna go in and you're gonna join those men and women who have given their lives for our freedom. Those people who have paid the ultimate price, you're gonna go meet them. This workout sucks. You throw on body armor, it sucks a little bit more. You're gonna suffer, you're gonna to wanna to quit, but you're not going to. You're gonna keep going. You're gonna remember everyone who has paid the price, everyone who worked a little bit harder, Everyone that wishes they could have come home to their family or those family members who have lost people overseas. They would do this every single day if they could have that person back for one hour, for one more minute. So I want to thank you guys for coming out. This is going to be an awesome event. It's going to be super fun. At least we have the heat to kind of keep us going today. And... Uh, Thank you guys.